Good evening and welcome to the 355th meeting of the wow. New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and the history of text image work. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And tonight, as part of Will Eisner Week 2023, we have a panel discussion uh, entitled Banned Comics, Old Problems, New Forms. The moderator is Danny Fingeroth, and Danny is the chair of Will Eisner Week and is an author and historian whose latest book is A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, out in paperback from St. Martin's Press. Uh, Danny was a longtime writer and editor at Marvel and is the author of Superman on the Couch, What Superheroes Really Tell Us About Ourselves and Our Society, and disguised as Clark Kent, Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero. And those books are also out in audio editions. And so, Danny, take it away. You'll introduce the panelists. Oh. Lynn, thank you so much. This is uh, an annual treat uh, to do uh, Will Eisner Week, which, uh, it, as a matter of fact, is an annual series of events celebrating comics and sequential art, graphic novel liter liter literacy, free speech, which is a lot of why we're here, and the legacy of comics and graphic novel pioneer Will Eisner, uh, who was one of the most innovative figures in the history of comics and graphic novels. Um, and uh, so that's, that's you know, our excuse for being here. And I am the chair of Will Eisner Week. Um, there's lots and lots of events. Actually, yesterday was would have been Will's 106th birthday, which is why Will Eisner Week is in the first week of March, because it's right around Will's birthday. Um, you can find out more about him and about Will Eisner Week at willeisner.com. There's all sorts of events going on. Uh, the past few years since uh, the uh, COVID began, uh, we've done a bunch of videos with some of the people uh, on the panel tonight, uh, but with Jerry Kraft and um, Gene Yang and um, Todd McFarlane. Um, there's just a, if you go to uh, the Will Eisner uh, YouTube page, there's lots and lots of stuff that you could use to do your own event this year or next year, or it's just very interesting stuff uh, to listen to and, and um, you know, kind of covers a lot of the breadth and depth of Eisner's career, as well as different people um, who admired and, and emulated him. Anyway, we are here tonight to talk about um, comic censorship and uh, its history, but more, really more its present uh, challenges that are presented. And uh, this panel is kind of a sequel. If you happen to be at the panel we did in San Diego uh, on this topic uh, in July, this is sort of part two or a sequel, although I don't imagine more than a handful of you are actually there. But um, this is, uh, you know, there was so much that was said and so much that we didn't get to say that I thought it would be, um, as my email to these folks uh, said, uh, we're getting the band back together. So that's B A N E D, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, Michael, uh, Michael Dooley apparently has uh, he weathered many a storm just to get here and uh, is wearing his, uh, his his battle scars. So thank you, thank you for persevering to all of you, but especially to Michael. Um, who was, was going to come whether he was conscious or not. Anyway, let me introduce everybody. Dennis Kitchen. Dennis Kitchen founded the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund in response to the arrest of a comic book store clerk who was wrongly prosecuted and convicted on obscenity charges for selling comics to an undercover police officer. Kitchen organized an industry fundraising effort to retain and pay for First Amendment expert Burton Joseph to wage the appeal against the conviction, which was victorious. Following this important win, Kitchen established CBLDF as an ongoing concern, that's the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, uh, as an ongoing concern to protect against future prosecutions. For the organization's first 18 years, he served as its president and nurtured it from a volunteer effort driven 
out of an office at Kitchen Sink Press, but not driven out of office, uh, to a professional uh, institution with a full-time staff. Welcome, Dennis. Um, Jerry Kraft is the New York Times best-selling author and illustrator of the graphic novels New Kid and Class Act. Uh, New Kid is the only book in, the, in history to win the John Newberry Medal for the most outstanding contribution to children's literature in 2020, the Kirkus Prize for Young Readers Literature 2019, and the Coretta Scott King Author Award for the most outstanding work by an African-American writer also in 2020. His new book, School Trip, is coming out next month. Jerry was born in Harlem and grew up in the Washington Heights section of New York City. Um, welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Jeff Smith, born and raised in the American Midwest. Jeff Smith learned about cartooning from comic strips, comic books, and watching animation on TV. After four years of drawing comic strip for Ohio State University student paper, Smith co-founded the Character Builders Animation Studio in 86. In 1991, he launched a company called Cartoon Books to publish his comic book, Bone, a comedy adventure about three lost cousins from Boneville. Jeff Smith's work is published in 13 languages and has won the highest awards in Germany, France, Italy, and at home, including a whole bunch of Eisner Awards. Jeff Trexler, before joining the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, where he's now the uh, acting director. Trexler was associate director of the Fashion Law Institute. He's a member of the Ethics Committee at Hearing Americas and has served on the board of the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art. Trexler was also a lifelong comics fan as well as a lawyer and has provided legal analysis on a variety of issues surrounding the comics industry. Uh, and last, but by no means least, and welcome Jeff, welcome both Jeffs. Uh, Michael Dooley is the creative director of Michael Dooley Design and teaches design history at the Art Center and LMU. I'm not sure what LMU is, but he'll tell us. He's also a book editor, print magazine, contributing editor and writer of feature articles and essays for print and other books and publications. <laughs> Michael wrote for Amazing Heroes and the Comics Journal. He directed programming and hosted events for the Masters of American Comics exhibit in Los Angeles in 2005 and co-edited one of the essential books on comics studies, The Education of a Comics Artist. Anyway, welcome folks um, and welcome audience. Thank you for coming by. Um, so I got a bunch of questions um, which I'm gonna ask <laughs> and uh, we'll go where we go. Uh, there have always been attempts to censor comics, often because uh, comics were and often still are thought of as just for kids. Also, the sheer visual nature of comics makes them easy targets. So um, I was thinking maybe Jeff Trexler and Dennis, but certainly anybody who would like to in the panel can give a little background of comic censorship of the past and, uh, and, and more importantly, the state of it now. So uh, maybe Dennis Kitchen, since you... Mm -hmm. Uh, were instrumental in forming the uh, Legal Defense Fund? Well, certainly long before the CBLDF, uh, comics censored themselves, as uh, most serious fans know. You had that comic code authority stamp up in the corner of uh, comics starting around the mid-1950s. I was growing up then and loving comics and especially loving like the horror and crime comics, which were the most coming under attack. And uh, as a kid, as a very young teenager, I did not understand what was happening, but suddenly the comics weren't as interesting anymore. They were getting very bland. And only later did I realize the industry was censoring itself, essentially in order to survive, which is probably more complicated than we want to get into tonight. Um, later, when... Uh, I first became a professional as the underground comics were blooming. They were basically, you know, begging to be censored. And uh, and ironically, uh, they were not because we kind of flew under the radar and our audience uh, was not uptight people who would have taken offense. You mentioned the bust at the uh, store in Friendly Frank's in suburban Chicago in, I think, 1986. I think you said uh, they sold obscene material to an undercover cop. Actually, they were accused of displaying obscene material, and they were uniformed cops. So 
they sold nothing and they didn't certainly didn't sell it to miners. So that's one reason we got very upset over that case. So you can certainly go back at least to the uh, 50s and someone else may have other examples, but that was the most notorious period of censorship and it came from within, ironically enough. Thanks. Um, Michael, as, the, uh, as a resident academic, do you have any, uh, any other history? No. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm sure I mean, do, but. <laughs> I mean, in terms of uh, censoring, uh, comics in American, sometimes I, you know, you use a banned, censored, uh, challenged, uh, th th that sort of thing. And we can get into the weeds with that, but just in speaking in general, in, in terms of the uh, the 1950s, it's a pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty <clears throat> much a, uh, a good marker in terms of historical context in the sense that uh, the 1950s was such a conservative, time and it, you know it's it from the very beginnings from the first american newspaper strips strips at the turn of the century you had uh, you know there was there was a catholic group there telling telling uh the newspapers no you should not be uh publishing buster brown because it encourages disobedience in kids and but the the 1950s i mean again from the perspective of we do want to talk about how all this stuff uh, relates to now, and uh, my one shameful confession <laughs> of the the one and the very only one thing that I have in common with the former president is that uh, he and I uh, were both born in the same hospital in uh, Queens, <laughs> New York. He was there two years before me, but the point of this is that I, you know, living back in New York, I, I knew him back in, I knew of him <laughs> back in the 80s. And it was one of those things where once he started coming up with the, with the Make America Great Again slogan, this is, you know, to a tribute to his ability to uh, twist communication is because he and I are roughly the same age. When I heard that, the first thing I thought of was, okay, he and I were both kids at the same time. What is he talking about? Because he, you know, that's one of his dodges. He never actually explains these things. But first time I heard it, it was like, make America 1950s again. And that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much what it is in terms of <clears throat> this horrible throwback that, that has been happening. And so, yeah, I'm definitely happy, very happy for that Danny's putting events like this on because I mean, what could be more crucial at, at this time? Um, so there's <laughs> there's that perspective. Well, thanks. Let me let me just um, now we have two. I mean, everybody here has been involved in making comics. We have two people, uh, specifically um, uh, Jeff Smith and 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 um, Jerry Craft whose work could, you know, it, it seems like about the most inclusive kind of work. And, and you know, I mean, sort of you look back at the, at the beginnings of the underground mm -hmm. and kind of that work in some ways was almost designed to be outrageous. It was like, you know, it was like Robert Crumb going, Bleh! here I am, like it or not, you know? But I don't think you guys are in that school and yet, uh, uh, you've you've managed to still excite controversy in our strange world. So uh, maybe uh, maybe Jerry, then uh, Jeff, maybe could talk a little bit about uh, about how your work was perceived, maybe in a way different than than you imagined it would be. Oh yeah, I remember uh, maybe in the early '90s doing a radio show for WNYC in New York with Art Spiegelman, Mark Allen Samadhi, and Stan Mack. And one of the things that was so funny was they were all talking about, hey, you know, don't you hate it when, you know, your editors are always telling you to calm it down, like stop pushing it, stop, you know? And I'm like, no, I'm just the opposite, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like I'm doing a family strip. I was doing a strip called Mama's Boys at the time. And, you know, when I tried to get into like the village voice or something like that, they're like, can't you have them curse? Or can't you have them do this? Or, you know, have them with this? And I'm like, no, that's not what I do. 
<laughs> and it's so funny that, that Stan Mack actually did a, one of his real life funnies on that. But I was always kind of like the family guy, like the, the boring guy, like just try to get it up there, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I was stunned, you know? Like I went out of my way to, there's no sex, there's no drugs, there's no cursing, you know, there's no gangs, you know? It, so my book, New Kid, is about a 12 year old and it's loosely based on things that happened to me in real life and my two sons. And he's a seventh grader. He wants to be an artist like I did. And his mom and dad sent him to a school in Riverdale. Uh, so each day he goes from his Washington Heights home which is mainly black and Latino to Riverdale and back. And um, I was so careful, like I even had someone complain that I put OMG in it. So I changed it in the next book to, oh my goodness, you know? <laughs> and, and to see a, uh, an article on MSNBC two weeks ago that was entitled, Why the GOP is Afraid of Jerry Craft's Cartoons, I almost <laughs> fell out of my chair. <laughs> so You've got um, them clicking in their boots, Jerry. Yeah, what so, right. What are they so upset right. I, you know what, I don't know. And it's so funny also on the, and they showed, I did a, um, a thing with, uh, Art Spiegelman and it's like, okay, new kid and mouse. And I'm there going, I don't know why I'm here, but okay. You know, so I, I listen more than anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they said that I'm teaching critical race theory and then, uh, let me see Marxism and huh? Who was they? Say it's they. Who said you were teaching? Oh, so it started in uh, in a small town in Texas, and it was a mom who uh, I was supposed to do a school visit there, a Zoom, and she got four hundred people to write a petition to sign a petition to ban my school visit. Which all I do is talk about going from a very reluctant reader to a Newberry winning artist. There's nothing, you know. And um, yeah, so they, they canceled the visit. They took my books off the shelves and then the school board went and they analyzed it and they realized that there was nothing wrong with it. And then they asked me to go back. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of it. <laughs> and, and Jeff, Jeff Smith, you've had sort of similar uh, vituperative responses to, the, to, to your stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I, I know why Jerry got banned. He's, he's woke. <laughs> or he's not, well, he's obviously woke because he lived through it, but he's sharing those experiences. And being woke is something that racists don't like. They just don't like it. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know anything bad ever happened. Nothing racial. You can't make anybody feel bad ab about, you know, that they made fun of somebody or anything. Uh, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I live half the year in Key West, which is where I'm at right now. And my governor is the biggest douchebag that I've ever, ever encountered. I mean, he is the proudest, most anti-woke person in the country at, at that political level. And there's no such thing as anti-woke. You're either woke and you can see what's going on, or you're asleep, or you're not awake, you're unwoke. But if you're anti-woke, you know what woke means, and that means you're anti what woke means. So it means you're a racist, straight up. And a lot of what's going on is the, are these phony made up culture wars. Um, that's really what's going on in the libraries and the, and the censorship and all that. Uh, I mean, Bone, imagine Bone being, uh, like Jerry, <laughs> Bone w was considered like, you know, Disney. You know, it's like it's 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 the hobbits. It's nothing. And yet it's it's for like the last 10 years, it's always in like the top 10 or in the top 20 most banned uh, books in America, not not just comics, but books. Um, and and then one of the reasons and I think this. OK, they, uh, there's obviously some drinking and tobacco. And I also use a, a word that upsets people called G. I have my characters go, geez, J-E-E-Z. 
um, which I just spelled because I thought that's how it was spelled, but I guess it's short for Jesus or something. Mm. Um, but I think it's most telling that one of the reasons, one of the most listed reasons for banning bone is a political viewpoint. Now, I don't think there's any political viewpoint in bone um, unless you consider um, questioning authority uh, or yeah, questioning authority be and don't you know don't don't trust people and do just what they tell you. Um, if that's if that's political viewpoint, then I can see that. And there are people, many, many, many people who do not want people to question authority at this time. We're in a really dodgy point in uh, in history, I think. And Jeff, I have to say, my oldest son, when he was about 10, like love Bone. I mean, that was the first series where he made me go out and buy all of them. So I had to kind of backtrack. I think he caught it like midway. So I had to kind of backtrack and get the first ones. And then I had to get each one after that. So he absolutely loved it. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's very cool. And I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to just say that the, my point I'm trying to make is that there's no question. Yes, there are real parents who are who see something and get upset. And that's that does happen. And it is real. But that's not mostly what's going on here. What's mostly going on here is an organized uh, attack on something that they think is CRT. And it's it's woke. Uh, it's it's elites who drink coffee and lattes, and it's all just phony. It's all just it's the most hopped up pretenses, and we have to recognize it and devise a scheme to fight back. Well, that, that, that's I think. Thank you, Jeff Smith, and now that brings us to Jeff Trexler, you know, um, mm -hmm. or uh, other Jeff. Uh, Jeff, from from your point of view, as both the acting president of the Legal Defense Fund and as an actual person with a law degree. Um, can you sort of expand on what these guys were saying? And from your Oh, yeah. And I really appreciated all the points so far. Some fantastic, really fantastic points uh, by all the speakers. I feel a little bit uh, uh, bad to be interrupting the flow because that was just a, a really, really great discussion. Um, and when I came into the CBLDF, there was uh, some talk you know, that maybe the CBLDF's time was done. Maybe because there hadn't, you know, been arrests of comic shop owners in a little while. And and that maybe 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 we had just gone past censorship and we're never going to see it again. And then, you know, it's not long afterwards, we're dealing with, you know, uh, Katy, Texas and Leander, Texas and um, Virginia, Fairfax in Virginia. And, and um, then, you know, we're in court. And for the first time in its history, you had... And because I'm a lawyer, I, I was representing Maya Kobabe in uh, author of Genderqueer in court against obscenity charges in Virginia. Uh, you know, just so just within a two, really starting in about maybe a year uh, when I was there, when I started. Uh, and then by, by, by two years, we have just been trying to put out fires every single day uh, that we're here. We're getting um, reports uh, from um retailers, creators, uh, students, teachers, parents, all over the country just concerned about what's happening in their community uh, with graphic novels being spe specifically targeted. Um, you know, and there are a couple of contrasts I wanna highlight with respect to that. Um, you know, one, you know, we're here at Will Eisner Week. Uh, and one thing that came to mind as we were dealing with this is that uh, we were seeing these objections and then starting in, in Texas again in, in Katy where, they were dealing with that was Katie Texas, wasn't it? Where they were dealing with your book was that was that Katie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, where they were dealing with were dealing with your book, um, and, and then some other places around the country, where they were saying, "Well, this is this is subliterate. Um, you, you don't want to read this stuff because uh, it, it's not teaching kids how to, how to how to read," um, which is really interesting, you know, from from an Eisner point of view, because when you think about you know comics and sequential art. There's a sense that that comics is an art form. It's a language. It has its own logic. It's had its own literacy, and in many ways, it's the language of the 21st century. You know, even even the way we're communicating today, everything is a hybrid of word and image. You just can't. You don't, don't live in a world where everything's just pure text anymore. Um, and so there's this conflict of worldview here, is where we all I think we all see 
uh, diffusion of word and image as, as, as potent and powerful, dynamic, essential for life today. And there are others that see it as somehow uh, corrosive when it comes to literacy, which is a, a point that Wortham made uh, 70 years ago. Uh, but another thing is just the power of the image itself as a as a as a negative force and just as a way of framing reality. And this is interesting. That was a, a point that was made against us in the case of Virginia. Now it lost happily, but it was a point that was made, which was that a comic is uniquely dangerous because a comic takes an image and freezes it. And so a kid can look at it. A movie, the images sort of flow, you know, or a text, you're not seeing the image, but there's so much content in an image that it can corrupt a child sexually um, if you have certain things depicted that are considered to be uh, obscene. And the definition of obscenity is often elastic and it, it encompasses a lot of things that wouldn't be legally considered obscene in traditional obscenity law. Uh, but when, when it's coming, when it's portraying things like social relations, um, they will see it as, and, and this is just the way it's working out now, they'll see it as largely framing uh, white people in the wrong way in terms of a long relation to others. And so if they will say, well, that has to be eliminated. That, that, that image um, uh, has to be gone, uh, which gets to the racist point that was just made uh, a, few, a few minutes ago. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it's been a, a fascinating argument uh, to, to try to respond to that and try to get people to see, well, yes, images are powerful, but they're not necessarily corrupting in the way that inherently corrupting or as, as one, you know, we talk about Will Eisner and the graphic novel and, and, and making that word standard. Well, um, graphic novels on the other side are referred to as graphic sexual novels. That was actually in the court filing. Um, they're trying to make graphic novel to refer not to an image, but to sex. Uh, um, which is one reason why we're seeing these these efforts in states around the country to require that all graphic novels have to be placed behind the circulation desk in a library and checked out with an ID showing that you're 18 years of older, like they were cigarettes or something, because a graphic novel refers to graphic sexuality. Um, but the other thing we're seeing is a revitalization of the display laws to sort of loop it all back that Dennis, Dennis was talking about. You know, those display laws, they were traditionally, you're thinking about uh, you know, triple uh, X, you know, the X rated stores that were selling uh, magazines or a display laws. You want to make sure that that the um, adult magazines are either behind the cash register store or up really high so kids can't access them. Now they're being pushed. The boundaries of these display laws are being pushed so that if you have anything with content in it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be in the cover. If you have anything with certain content in it displayed in a way that can be seen by a minor, and that should be cause for you to be arrested. And there are efforts even to revise display laws around the country to make it easier to arrest people, which is one reason why retailers are now getting, and, and librarians are now getting very concerned. Well, so, thanks, Jeff. I mean, it's, you know, I think we, you know, we discussed this in San Diego and I think it's, it's worth bringing up again. I mean, with literally anything available on the internet to anybody who can, claim they're 18 on the internet, nobody knows or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it brings home more what, uh, what everybody's been saying, how performative this outrage is that, that in seconds, people can see the most uh, extreme, outrageous stuff. And yet there's something, there's something else, it seems to me there's something else going on, you know, really you know what about the children you know i mean what's that what's that about in a world where you can see everything you know what what's with book, banning books overall and and graphic novels in particular and that's for everybody not just for jeff but uh, certainly i'm sure jeff has a lot to say about it anybody else i'll jump that? in and then please uh, let everybody let everybody talk but one of the things um one of the things that we saw uh, was the power of Zoom. Um, and, and I think it's a reason why schools, a lot of this started in schools and it's spread out ripple effects into retailers and, and, and public libraries and this sort of thing. Um, where we first started seeing it in sort of late 2020 and it was really starting hitting a stride in mid 2021 was you had parents, you know, kids were taking classes at home and for years, you know, Comics have been gradually introduced in the curriculum. They've been a normal part of many academic curricula around the country, but parents weren't seeing that in the same way as they do when uh, the parent is sitting in the living room and the kid or you know, walking through the house and they're seeing what the kid is studying on the computer. 
And all of a sudden people were going, um, OMG, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, or maybe not OMG, maybe they were doing something, oh my goodness, or something. But they were saying, this is horrible. You know, look at that. We have comics. I, I want them to go to school and they're reading comics or I want them to be in school and they're, they, you know, gender queer is appearing on the screen or something like that. And seeing things on Zoom, seeing the image in their room got them thinking that, you know, this, uh, coupled with the general anxiety, the COVID period, that something was very seriously wrong with schools. And it, it starts rippling out to libraries and being that now they're being, now they're concerned about shops again and, and online stores. Uh, but but in many ways, the very thing we're doing now was a hub, um, a nexus, a springboard, whatever metaphor you want to use uh, of the problem we're all now trying to solve. Well, Jeff, one, one of the things that was so interesting and in why it is about race is because when I was a kid, I hated to read because anyone who looked like me was either enslaved or, you know, civil rights struggle or police brutality. So I found way more in common with uh, Peter Parker or Charlie Brown mm -hmm. than I ever did with any African-American protagonist in a book or a comic, you know, who was a sidekick or just, you know, even in the movies. And so nobody ever tried to protect me from those images of the same thing over and over again. And I always give the analogy, it's like if the only books that moms could read to their daughters were books like A Handmaid's Tale, where it just shows the, the women in such a subservient manner, you know, like what does that do for them, for their psyche? So no one was protecting me from that secondary character and as a result like I had uh, I have uh, uh, English professors now there's an African-American uh, English professor who said she still remembers when she was in second grade and, and the teacher read the book on slavery and her little white friend who was her best friend and with all good intentions said in front of the class you know if if you were my slave I would have freed you <laughs> You know, so to this day, she's mortified by that. But again, the girl meant, you know, the best that she knew, you know what I mean? And then to see my sons in third and fourth grade reading a book on Rosa Parks, and they're just reading the words, but not trying to teach the empathy that goes with it. So then it's like, okay, everyone, like, line up, or let's get on the bus. And they tell my sons, oh, well, you have to get on the back of the bus because you're Black. So now when people like myself grow up to write books that are the opposite of those that actually have us on the same playing field, not, not even better, not looking down, but equal, now it's like we are doing something that is wrong. But again, no one ever tried to protect me. If I had been protected, I might not have ever grown up to write these books. If I could uh, build on another thing that a very important point that Jeff uh, was making about COVID, it was this whole escalating attack on uh, graphic novels started up around the time when, you know, basically uh, parents were suddenly having to take on teaching duties as well. And that's really what brought about the whole, what started it all incident with uh, Spiegelman's mouse. This was this was a school board going going in and saying, you know, well, you know, we, we've got to start controlling what our, you know, suddenly they're paying attention to teachers uh, <laughs> and, and in a very counterproductive way to put it mildly. So yeah, you, you've now got, and you know, and the school boards, you know, at that escalation, it's like, okay, here's another plan and here's what we do. And, and it's just been spinning around and, and, and growing, wouldn't you say, Jeff? Uh, uh, Jeff? Jeff got muted. We have, we have a comment in the chat. We have a comment in the chat about how it's growing even at the university level. Oh, there you go. Um, uh, Jay's comment about uh, experiencing Zoom pushback uh, against faith, against life. It's, it's several books and, and people, yeah, it's, it's, it's been this, this powerful force. Well, who's the, I mean, I actually wanted to ask that. So I guess as long as it's been brought up, who is that pushback from Michael and anybody else who's teaching in college? Is it, I mean, you know, we hear all these cliches about how like 
college students are so uh, you know oversensitive and they're and they need a trigger warning and everything is that really is that is that as big a problem as it's made out to be or is that something that people just like to exaggerate um again for their own to, to, to push whatever their own agenda is i would i talk danny i've talked to a lot of uh librarians and they say that that the same speeches are being read out to them over and over again like the exact same words and i've been in i've been on these panels in multiple states and the librarians will say this it's the same panels you know like from gender queer or something and the same exact words are being used so mm -hmm. there's obviously some central uh or origin point right. for a lot of this and I, it, it really does appear that what's happening is that they're they're trying to whip parents up into something and i, I mean i i can't i don't want to overblow how many librarians i've talked to but uh, oh at least a, you know a dozen and i can't think of one who hasn't said i ask if they've read the book and they always say no so and 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 to just get back to like it's the 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 original reason comic shows are attacked is that we're not really real reading we're gonna we're gonna dumb down the kids uh i just spent four days in seattle at the emerald city comic con and i mm -hmm. had easily six people tell me something along the lines of i i never could read i just didn't i wasn't able to like get it but thanks to your book i can and i had two people who said they were dyslexic and they couldn't read until they were able to put it together with graphic novels starting with with bone well, that so it's not sense. it's not illiterate at all yeah and and and, and i mean say the let's say the college stuff the quote unquote trigger warnings i mean that's usually associated with more liberal lefty type people but yeah, well, I don't get we've this. had we've had cases yeah. of we've had cases of people protesting you know, teaching Robert Crumb, teaching undergrounds as as problematic. I mean, it, there, there are cases where it does cut both ways. Yeah. Um, well, hey, I mean, um, that, that can be a cause of somebody not getting their contract renewed. It can be a cause of somebody losing tenure. It can be cause of being put on administrative leave. It's 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 um, it, it's real is just just from what I've seen, just in cases that have come over our transom and I've had to spend time dealing with. And is, uh, and is certainly Dennis can testify to that. Uh, the the crumb uh, problem has been around since the late 1960s, and it's pretty much been nonstop until now. It's just you know it it takes uh, different forms. But just to get back to the question you were asking in terms of what sort of problem it is, yes, there are always there are always going to be pockets of people who react in certain ways that may not be the the best thought through or or otherwise but uh, you know myself personally i'm uh i'm a professor at art center college of uh, design i teach my classes uh, design history of comics and animation and i got the green light from the very beginning to uh to go ahead and and teach what i want and know that i handle it obviously that uh we're, we're talking art center, great. which is an uh which is a art design school and uh you know, visually, you know, <laughs> we have a certain degree of uh, hipness <laughs> that's that's absent in quite a few other places mm -hmm. around. But yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and you get pushback. Problem, problem. And, 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 uh, and, and push it's, Sorry, well, speak, speaking of Crumb, you know, <laughs> not not very long ago at SPX in Bethesda, mm. Carol Tyler and Durf Backdurf were guests. And on a panel, when I think they were asked about their influences, they both cited Crumb. And at the mention of his name, there was booing and hissing in the audience. And this is, uh, again, not a right wing crowd. So the attempt to censor someone saying, honestly, this is an influence on me, you know, I mean, this should not be booed and hissed, in my opinion. And um, there's a difference between booing and hissing and, you know, campaigning to get librarians fired. Absolutely. Was, it's it's degrees, but you have to be very wary when you start to see degrees coming from, say, unexpected corners of the culture where I would expect I, more. I, I, I would expect that. comics fans in general to be more tolerant. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, but you know, uh, it, 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 it even affected Crumb to the degree that he said he was uh, f- very wary coming to the states, thinking that he could be subject to some really, uh, you know, toxic attacks. And it's a worrisome area, separate from what we're normally looking at as censorship and banning. Well, I mean, I, I, I guess. I guess it's a mark that comics have been accepted that we're that we're now part of the whole culture war. That's not just, you know, Frederick Wortham saying, "Well, comics will make people idiots" or whatever. You know, it's 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 suddenly comics are now uh, such a part of this larger culture war we live in. I mean, how you know, and and it's very hard. You know, that's why I sort of asked, and I'll and I'll re ask. You know. How much of it is just newspapers looking for a story or somebody looking to get publicity or is it does every teacher face it is this something that every teacher every librarian has to deal with or is it or is it isolated cases anybody have I, would, a I would say isolated i would say isolated but uh you know that but highly publicized because like you say you gotta sell the <laughs> sell the product uh the news so is is there any effort to I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I would say I, I actually lean more towards where Jeff, Jeff the other, the other Jeff, <laughs> um, the creator Jeff, uh, was coming from, which is that we have funded networks and we have memetic networks or sort of imitative networks. Uh, you know, part of the appeal I think that, that spread it nationwide was uh, the. It's a it's an easy way to get a lot of YouTube likes and Twitter likes to go to a school board and hold up some pictures from, you know, new kid or uh, gender queer or let's talk about it or flamer um, and and then just post it and then bam, you're going to have a lot of people swarming to you. You may even get on Tucker Carlson um, and, and it's everywhere. It's New York, Connecticut, Maine, uh, Portland. Uh, it's sea to shining sea uh, uh, of censorship. Um, so I, I guess just from my vantage point where I get emails from all over the country, it's not just people think it's just Republican areas, just the South. Um, that's not my inbox. It's everywhere. Is there any, I know that I know that there's been a lot of resistance overall to putting like an MPA AA type rating on comics. <laughs> Is that something that people ask for? Would that help? Is it just, is it just giving in to bullying? What? Uh, make America 1950s again. <laughs> well, but we have it in the movies now. It's it's not the, the when when the, the other side movies are all rated when now. the petitioner lost in Virginia Beach. I'm sorry. When the petitioner lost to Virginia Beach, he went outside the courthouse and said his next action was going to be um, introducing a bill in the Virginia, Virginia legislature to require a rating system on uh, on these graphic novels. And we're seeing bills across the country and, and a little bit of behind the scenes. I mean, one of the things that I pointed out um, and, and then sort of let some people know when it went viral was that uh, the initial bills actually just copied the MPA system, which I happen to know is trademarked. So, said, <laughs> you know, and, and then the MPA gets in touch with them and says, hey, I hear you're doing the uh, you're using our trademarks. You really can't do that. And so it at least kicked it back a few months. But there are serious efforts around the country to mandate rating systems uh, for these that, kind of books. Would that necessarily be bad? That's that's my question about it. Would that? Uh, I'll, I defer to everybody else here. I'd really be interested in well, hearing what you all have to say. Well, Jerry and Jeff uh, Jeff Smith, what would you guys think if somebody started rating your work? <laughs> Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because like I said, in, in the case of my son, um, you know, I mean, it, it's so subjective, you know, like even in, in the case of, um, so my, my next book coming out is called School Trip. And basically the class goes to Paris for a week. So there's already, I see, um, well, I'm not gonna show this to my kids because they won't be able to relate to this i'm like but they can relate to a kid who goes to wizard school and flies around in the broom with a magic wand like you never know what they use to to really cover up something else 
You know what I mean? So is it really that they don't want to see kids go to Paris because they'll make other kids feel bad? Or do they not want to see these black kids going to Paris? Because why should they? You know what I mean? Like, so w when you start putting these ratings on there, it's like, yeah, is it a standalone, like just on language or just on this on that? But if it's just like them arbitrarily saying, well, I don't think this is appropriate because then, you know, it just snowballs. You need to have a, your publisher needs to have a contest when a trip to Paris with Jerry Craft, you know? But right, exactly. I think you, should, you should send them to Paris, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> now that, right. That, that that. Or, send them, or send them a copy of the movie. That's <laughs> have any of you guys, have any no. have you encountered firsthand any of those kind of, you know, crazy school board or, or board of trustee meetings where people become abusive? Have any of you? Uh, had that happened to you? I had someone send me one, but I just refused to look at it because when I'm doing these, what I think lighthearted, funny books, I have to try to protect my brain and keep my psyche in such a way that I can, you know, uh, give this stuff, give my best effort to these kids, as opposed to just being, you know, like just downtrodden from that, like, wow, Mr. Kraft's books all of a sudden got really dark and depressing. Like, what's up with that? <laughs> a lot of Mr. Kraft's characters went crazy and started killing him. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, this was quite a big topic uh, at the last uh, San Diego Comic-Con we were at. This was like one of, I, I think, uh, <laughs> Jeff Smith was on, was on 152 uh, censorship uh, comics panels. And, what, and so there was a lot of talk just, you know, along the halls and what, and so you heard, Thing I heard one uh, that struck me regarding a librarian who was having to deal with that sort of problem. It, it's like, you know, with the people coming in is, you know, you can't show this book, you have to, you know, whatever, <laughs> get, get it off the shelves and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and it was just, it was just constant. And I actually mentioned this in, in, uh, l last time, it was constant until he came up with a form that they had to fill out in which mm -hmm. they sat down and explained exactly what the objections were. <laughs> Suddenly, the, the, re, the demands to stop giving books uh, uh, off the shelves. <laughs> I think I remember that. And there was actually a box on there if you had actually read the book. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah everybody's mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. <laughs> but to, you know, to be actual, actually be able to articulate it. But then even then, when you get into what they were saying about uh, the Spiegelman book, that again, when this whole thing started, it, it's like, you know, there's, um, you know, we object to this because of, you know, the, the nudity, dead, dead mice and, and you know, Art Spiegelman's <laughs> suicide, mother's suicide, you know, it's, and, you know, cuss words. It, it's just nonsense. And they, they say it and they take it seriously. And they, I'm sure that these people on the school board, you know, sincerely believe this, this crap that they're spouting. And, and yeah, it's, it's, again, it's spreading. <laughs> Somebody else talk. <laughs> is there a difference in kind between people who want to ban something outright as opposed to they want to just have it for a certain age group? I don't know. Is that is that ever valid or is it just a stalking horse for the rest? I didn't hear what you said. You know, if somebody says, well, I don't want to ban this book, but I don't want, you know, anybody under 15 reading it, is that ever valid or is that just a stalking horse for more censorship? If a parent doesn't want their kid to read it, that's one thing. You, you have that right to stop your kid from reading it. Right. You don't have the right to stop everybody's kids from reading it or you know whatever age group you're talking about. You're banning books. The people that ban books are not the good guys. They <laughs> just don't, they don't know what they're talking about. And yeah, and, and like back to Crumb, I get it. I'm a fan of Robert Crumb's, but I get it that he's problematic. But just booing him is not trying to ban his books. It's, no, but it was inhibiting free speech in a way that uh, I, I, it wouldn't inhibit. I mean, but was it really inhibiting? Well, Did people actually shut up? Uh, well, my understanding, I wasn't there, but I was told Durf and Carol both had to basically apologize one later on Twitter, as I recall. 
but that reminds me too much of the Red Guard in China or something. We, you know, we don't need to shame people because they say somebody influenced me. That's just a fact. Yeah, I'm I agree. Saying, I agree. You have to read it yourself. <laughs> Apologize for what? What were they apologizing for? For Christ? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I'm sorry they did that. Uh, yeah. No. That's yeah. That's not right. So before. Well, my thing is, I've, I've never actually had an adult come to me and say, my kid read this and was offended. Or even a letter from a kid or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, and some, there was one woman, uh, this is a Black woman. She didn't like that I used the term Oreo. But that, you know, as a Black kid that goes to private school, an Oreo is something that black kids call each other, a derogatory term, meaning that they're black on the outside, but on the inside, they, they're white, I mean, they act white. She's like, well, I didn't want my kid to, to know what that meant. I'm like, well, it's better he learns it from me than when he gets called that, you know? But um, yeah, if, if there were focus groups, if it was something that that if they read it with their kid and they got that if they heard kids talking about it but for it to just be pulled out of thin air and again it's only for their kids they don't care how many books that my kids read and get offended on and, and that's one of the the one of the other big problems that i have about it um before we go to Q and A, I just uh, I, I think I, I I'd like to, I want to ask a question with an asterisk. That's sort of right. I'm one of those people who has like a, not a speech, but a, a very long. Anyway, here's the question: What can what can people do individually? What can people do institutionally? And I'll and my asterisk and sort of my my auxiliary paragraph is I think it was on the on the Legal Defense Fund either on their site or on one of the links. It gives a list of suggestions and instructions for what librarians can do if they come up with a problem. And it was like a 10 part instruction manual that that was that that if I was a librarian, I'd go, well, let me see, uh, you know, where can I go get my um, my MBA? Because clearly my life of dedicating myself to books, if it's going to be this complicated, if it's going to, if it's going to take a 10 step program for me to even begin to fight back you know um i mean oh, it's I, all, that's in the process of being updated by the way danny that, that was that was different okay. different time I mean, that really that different just, different regime okay it well get it done quick because it just made me seem like this is so difficult and mm -hmm. so literally above my pay grade as a librarian although i got i gotta say and i think i, I did a tweet thread about this last week a uh, twitter thread about this last week um it is it is problematic for librarians because um it's bureaucratizing everything um if you see some of the policies that are now being required in the name of and, and again there's sort of a confluence of, of you want to you want to uh, deal with different values and some of it'll be for ratings but a lot of be okay we're going to look at this statute and assess the book in light of this statute and the librarian if they're going to introduce a book has to analyze the book in light of that statute, this statute, this statute, and this statute with section numbers. And, and you're going, well, why the hell would I introduce a book? Because I don't want to have to get a lawyer just to get a freaking graphic novel in my in my library. Right. And I think that's part of the part Actually, of the point. It's paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. So <laughs> so how do you how do you make it, you know, I mean, I hope you are doing it, but I mean the I like I said, I started reading this, like what do we do? And it's and they're all like they're all sort of almost classroom scenarios. They're almost like, well, this they'll say that, and you should say this. And of course, what do you do when somebody comes up and threatens to punch you in the face? I mean, that's sort of you know, how do you deal with that? And and I'm open that to anybody who has any. I can cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't look like it worked for you, Michael. I was. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm serious. Hmm. I, I, I said it in a kind of humorous way, but I mean, it's. Are there any strategies, any any um, ideas for for people? Because um, you know, it's all the only the only strategy I I really heard from librarians was the one that Michael uh, he's on that side of the screen for me. I don't know if he is for anybody. Yeah, else. No, it's, um, it's the one that Michael brought up, where a librarian came up with just a form, 
not a complicated form, just a form. And it was a way to like, stop yelling at me and fill this out. You know, just a way to, I don't know how often it works. I, it's the only thing I've heard of. Yeah. So I don't really know how, how well it works. Right? Hmm. Well, in, t in two words or less, it's fight back. I mean, this is something that we got hmm. into in the uh, Comic-Con as well. It's in addition to, I'm sure uh, Jeff Trexler has uh, some advice or two on, on things that, uh, that people can do, but, you know, whatever it may be, whatever you're feeling that, that strongly about, you know, if it's, you know, if you got schmucks and <laughs> obstructionists on the school board, you join this, whatever it might be, just, you know, like, uh, think globally, act locally. Uh, really, there are, there are just so many ways, but to, because, yeah, we've got, we've got, <laughs> We've got election coming up next uh, year, and, and you know, for for books in in general, and and yeah, you know, it's just getting worse, and and graphic novels in in particular, this is definitely something that you know, don't wait, <laughs> don't wait to cast a ballot to vote. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's recognizing that something fact, is going on. Something is going on. Yes, there are real parents that have real concerns. Sure. But there is something else going on that's a little more nefarious and we need to recognize it. <laughs> I hope we could identify it and make them look foolish, I guess. So we fight back. Is Julie's right. Fight back. Well, I, I, but I mean, specific, so I guess I'll drill down. Specifically, if you come up against that proverbial somebody threatening to punch you in the mouth, I mean, what, what is a librarian, you know, what, uh, what, what do you do? What is a librarian? Call a cop. <laughs> You're not allowed to punch librarians in the mouth. <laughs> it, it can't get too loud, though. It is a librarian, after all. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, um, I know people have been putting questions in the chat, but I've been kind of listening, and some of the questions are very, very long. So well, I, I was wondering. I could perhaps. I could perhaps. I'm a big on transitions. To do a transition, I. Last time I looked, there were at least uh, three other uh, uh, Will Eisner Comic Industry Awards uh, judges from the past, and I'd be interested in in having them join in a conversation. What with it being Will Eisner, we can all uh, to to actually uh, talk a bit about the degree to which the degree to which something like that actually. Uh, can and will and does and <laughs> is making a difference. I mean, uh, okay, I was a judge in uh, 2020, and and I can think just offhand of of names I've seen on uh, Jeff's comic book uh, legal defense fund site. There there have been a, at least uh, eight or nine of them that were the ones that that we uh, my group. Uh, one of which I'm happy to see here. Uh, it was uh, it just it was one of those things that just went on that no discussion needed to be made. These were these were you know <laughs> five other smart people. Uh, in fact, the big one, the the big winner that year was Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me. That was that was the one that was getting the most. You know there was George. Uh, they call us enemies. Uh, oh, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, Jeff's got stories on that. The Handmaid's Tale, the graphic novel. Uh, Kiss Number Eight, Moonstruck, uh, Lumberjanes, Snow Glass Apples, uh, and my mm -hmm. solo exchange uh, diary, uh, sequel to my lesbian experience with loneliness. These are all books that we just got on so naturally. So that, I mean, the whole idea of them being problematic wasn't even discussed. Oh yes, and there was one other uh, book that uh, we managed to get on that uh, 2020 Eisner Award nominee uh, list. Um, that uh, name of the book was called New Kid by Jerry Crabb. Hey. Hmm. <laughs> the, the, the people on the, on the on today's panel who I think knew Will the best, which would be Dennis and uh, Jeff, any inspiration or actual things you remember Will saying about situations like this or censorship in general? Hmm. I, I, I just found out today that in 1949, Will, there was a spirit story that had a character named uh, Dr. Wolfgang Worry, who organized the comic book burnings. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would say um, when the CBLDF was just in its infancy, the first thing I did to raise money was 
I decided we'll do a portfolio. And I remember mm -hmm. going to Will and he absolutely jumped in without any hesitation. And um, if you go back to 1986 and someone, you know, like Will basically joining arms with a lot of unsavory underground cartoonists to defend things that were busted uh, in Illinois, I'm not saying it was particularly brave, but it's not something I could have assumed he'd be comfortable doing, but he did it without hesitation. And what was, uh, what was his take on Trump? <laughs> He appreciated some of it. Um, I remember one time I was encouraging Will to be more um, realistic in his dialogue and uh, some of the ways he was uh, approaching a story. And he said, he said, I'm going to stop you right there. I can't let it all hang out like crumb, which <laughs> I thought was a funny hippie phrase to basically say, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do it my way, like Frank Sinatra, not like... Uh, uh, like our crumb. As well as but, a double entendre. But basically, you know, Will was on my comp list. So he got a lot of underground comics and he was, I'm sure, given them by others. And he came to be very fond of some of them, particularly Justin Green, uh, like Binky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary and Jack Jackson, a number of people. So Will was very open basically to all forms of expression and he wasn't judgmental some things were not to his taste uh, some of you may know his first reaction to s clay wilson was not good but there's some some generational aspect that you you can't deny there but but certainly he was as supportive of the cbldf as anyone he didn't ask s clay wilson to draw any diagrams for a ps magazine or <laughs> wasn't going to happen no <laughs> well, for me, for me Will, Will was uh, Will. It was Will's attitude about his absolute confidence in comics as an art form. He was there was just nothing. There was no question about it. He he believed in it as an art form, and and thus no boundaries. I mean, if you put rules on painting, you're not going to get a Picasso, right? Uh, or a red wall or anything if uh you but he just he had i didn't see that anywhere he was always um it was just his attitude he just comics you knew you knew when you were with will and comics was safe that's why that's the best way i could put it and i i don't think he would i don't believe he would accept anybody questioning comics just because they're comics and that's kind of what's happening although it's probably because they're also an easy target yeah, and there's there's a note in the, you know, I've I've been talking. In fact, this is a theme of my of the panel we did in at Emerald City, uh, importance of local action. And there's a note there about Kutztown, which is just a few miles from where I grew up, and I used to buy comics there all the time at a shop at a flea market called Renningers. And um, but these kids formed a, a book club where they talk about these books. And this is another thing about the legacy of of, of Will Eisner, you know, when I think. Um, there's defensive action and there's preemptive action. And I think uh, one of the more po most powerful things we can do nationwide, and we can talk about defensive action in a bit, but is, is just create a local culture where you're talking about these books and talking about the books in a way that is not, okay, this book is being banned. And so what's, what do they say is bad about it? And how would we respond to that? But talk about the book as a book, you know, talk about the visual logic and the storytelling uh, techniques in New Kid. Talk about, you know, how how they communicate things. Talk about how these images work, how, how these sequences work, how, um, what's really going on in these panels. Get people to understand these graphic novels as graphic novels, and um, and make it look make it so that that anybody who tries to challenge them seems illiterate. Because I mean that's been a, the mo one of the most frustrating things for me is how many books are being um, there are things being said about books are being misrepresented nationwide. Um, I mean there's a section in a brief that I that I co-wrote for the um, Virginia Beach case where it's just like saying they're saying this is going on about this graphic novel this is this is this happened this happened this happened and it didn't happen they don't know how to read the panels they don't know what really went on and I think if you had a culture where people People were just used to talking about comics and knew these books before anybody started th throwing mud at them. 
um, emerging creators as well as some of the established ones, um, we, we might be able to stop these things in their tracks. Hmm. Yeah, the woman who um, tried to get me banned, we did a, a NPR thing, they interviewed her, and I believe she said that in the first chapter alone, that white adults call the police on black children five times in the first chapter alone that doesn't happen in any of my three books mm -hmm. combined mm -hmm. yeah so it looks like henry baraja i know i'm pronouncing his name wrong um had a, had a lot to say and a bunch of comments and questions so maybe uh, henry uh you want to unmute and um oh yeah where are you Henry, oh, let's see. Oh. He didn't even like the fact that I even oh. broke the possibility yeah. of reading. He thought that was a uh, another. Oh. Where are you, Henry? Somebody from Sydney says uh, Henry left. That's <laughs> Sydney. Actually yeah, said it. it will on the hour. We get a little drop off, but uh, let's see. Someone can. Uh, Paraphrase his question. Uh, he well, he certainly didn't like that I even brought up the idea of rating. You know, he wanted to censor me from talking about ratings. You know? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a boo there. I don't know. He seemed like he had come uh, looking for a fight, so I thought that make for might make for an interesting uh, question. But uh, apparently, uh, he didn't get his money's worth on this, and he left. Um, uh, I, I do think, I mean, I think Henry, and, and he says it's a fascinating question because I can tell you it's, it's one we have to deal with with the fund because you have, um, yeah, they're different, they're different levels and they're people who are opposed to censorship, but they feel like uh, they're at risk. And so you have retailers who want some kind of system so they know how to minimize exposure because the local mm -hmm. DA is, is on the hunt for books that could be problematic from a display, you know, harmful to minors law. And so they just want to know what's in the book without having to read, you know, 1500 SKUs um, every month, every week or every month or something. Um, so, so you have that kind of demand, that kind of demand. You have the people who are just really trying to shut down graphic novels kind of demand. You have parents who are just a little confused and how to, how to deal with sort of, how to work through, you know, what is legitimate, what is stifling, what is censoring, um, how do you respond in a more nuanced way to fear? I mean, these are these are real issues that we're we're trying to work through, and they often can't be solved with a a ten part um, you know test that you were talking about earlier, ten step thing. I mean, this is it's it's one of the big questions of the age, and I, and I wish Henry here. I'm actually going to email Henry after the after the talk and and chat with him about that because. It is it is a live discussion going on right now, almost like a call for a comics code 2.0. Yeah, I'm not I, mean, I was I was talking to somebody over over the weekend at Emerald City who's a computer engineer, and he was talking about how, you know, with just a little bit of training, you could get something like Chat GBT to screen out uh, a, a books. It would be an ultimate censoring device. And that's you know how how we're dealing with that in the context of of ratings and seals and digital algorithms. It's it's a it's a huge, huge, huge question. Yeah, I wasn't advocating it. I just thought it was a topic that sort of. Oh, we know, we know why you created this panel, Danny. It's just to, uh, it's just to get that seal back there. Well, it, it's for the Danny Fingeroth official rating your program that I'll trade. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not an idiot, you know. Um, uh, some somebody named Kevin D, who I think might be related to one of our panelists, uh, had some had some had some questions. Yeah, don't listen to him. He's just my younger brother. <laughs> well, mm. um, well, so he's more hep than you because he's uh, exactly he's so much younger. He wanted to know if I had any problem with the Co Comics Code Authority <clears throat> and Marvel uh, constantly. And Kevin, I'm sure you had it at DC too. That was, but that was sort of the name of the game. That you know, those those were uh, you know that that was that was what we were doing. It was Comics Code approved uh, or disapproved books. I will say that, in my experience, what they approved and disapproved was totally inconsistent, and and, and uh, you know it was very hard to know. So we probably, you know, we probably ended up um, censoring ourselves at times that we didn't have to, and then some weird thing that we thought would be completely harmless uh, would go by. But yeah, it was 
and you know they i guess it stopped existing about 10 years ago for that reason um but uh you know but the, that that that'll that'll be for another um you know uh, mm. an, an, another day that you know, it's a panel you know but yeah we did uh, we did have that uh kevin do you have any follow-up to that or was there i thought you had another question <laughs> He gave us some crapola there in the. <laughs> yeah. They trapped crapola. <laughs> yeah. CCA. Did they suggest crapola or did you? It was, it was the. Uh... Just did crapola and they accepted it. Uh, <clears throat> um, all right. Then, anybody else have questions to put in the chat or um, let's. I, I, well, you know, while we're waiting for other. Uh, I had a couple of others that I wanted to. I guess I guess even just you guys. I mean, we're talking about librarians, and I you know, probably next time we should have a librarian. But I mean, I would imagine that none of you got into making comics or teaching comics or being involved with comics because you, you know, I, I'm guessing you pro there's probably a certain amount of uh, antisocial uh, aspect where like, boy, I can do comics and not have to deal with. Okay, I'm just speaking about myself. I can do comics, not have to deal with the real world. And you know, how do you feel that this has been thrust on you? That uh, you know that 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 this stuff is happening, and and obviously you agreed to be on this panel and similar panels. Uh, what made you come out of your uh, your studios and your bunkers and 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 want to face this head on? I can I can come up with uh, the opposite answer to what what you're looking for in the sense that uh, it was comics that that got me engaged in the real world when I was seven years old in a way that, that nothing else. I mean, this is why Mr. Kurtzman, you know, will, will always be my, uh, my God, the, uh, the son, I guess, uh, in, my, in my pantheon. But yeah, to be able to, I mean, okay, context, uh, born in 48, still managing to, you know, take the blows. And so in 1955, it was, I was in the, uh, I was in the comics uh, shop uh, back in New York and I look was, was, was looking at all, you know, the, the, the peanuts, beautiful, gory layout. Uh, and I saw a, a cover, what, what I thought was uh, the inside of a magazine folded open to the, long story short, it was the Harvey Kurtzman issue of the 10 cent mad first appearance by Alfred E. Newman that actually was making fun of the Johnson and Smith ads that were running inside on the cover. And it was, you know, for me, it was, it was one of those things that, you know, at that tender, <laughs> at that tender age, my entire life has been completely transformed. And, you know, there is not, not a week go by, goes by that I don't think about Harvey in some way or other. So, you know, there, there's escape and then there's, you know, bringing you, <laughs> bringing you in, which is why now I've got mm -hmm. a, uh, <laughs> whatever, 68 year obsession with comics. Okay, next. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Anybody, I mean, it, it, see, it seems to me that, and, I'm, and I say this in an admiring way, that you guys have an almost, uh, I don't know if there's great power, but there's great responsibility. You know, so, so what, so, um, Dennis, you've been fighting this fight for forever. You know, starting you know with the very beginnings of the underground. What's what? Why do you keep at it? And what's changed? What 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 problems been solved? What remain to be solved? Well, you know, the problem never goes away; it just takes different shapes. As uh, Jeff Trexler knows, the kind of issues. The fun faces today are not the issues we faced in the late 80s or 90s. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to say, I'll be the devil's advocate. I think we should put uh, warning labels on bone. They should say, oh, geez, tread carefully. <laughs> um, I mean, I do try. One of the things I, th I think it's not always easy to do is listen respectfully to the people who are attacking because more often than not, I think they, they have a good heart and good intentions. They don't understand comics. They misunderstand intent. And uh, 
and they probably uh, are, are not familiar with the the concept of free speech like we are because we we pay a lot of attention to it. They're just worried what their nine year old might bring home, and I think we have to learn to be respectful of that in a way that uh, any parent would. I mean, I remember as a kid when I was quite young, I could go to a spinner rack and before the code, uh, you know, censored comics, I could bring home Crime Does Not Pay or really weird, creepy horror comics. And, you know, I think my parents looked askance at them, but they weren't really reading them and, you know, questioning it in a way that maybe uh, a lot of other parents were, or you wouldn't have had Dr. Wortham's... Uh, view prevail back then i just think we need to listen more and not always reflexively just think that oh, these people are stupid crazy whatever and do try to respond it's the same way i feel sorry for the poor retailer who has to go through all these skews and he has to know geez does this have mature content does it not i think we have to listen and there may be a solution that's not censorship but it's helpful in the same way that if you're watching a something on hbo it'll warn you if there's adult content language nudity whatever <clears throat> i don't think these things are necessarily things we can't talk about and say is there a possible solution to these complaints and preserve still the freedom of expression which is the most important thanks Dennis. uh that dually guy Somebody else want to answer? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Anybody else want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be great if there were actually people that wanted to have an intelligent conversation or that started out by actually reading uh, the book, but it's also our livelihood. So if I, you know, have a school visit planned for six months, and then I fly to Florida and then the night before it's banned and I've flown down there, you know, for nothing, yeah. you know, there's no conversation. There's no, even if it said, Hey, let's have a one-on-one -on -one. let's talk instead of just a regular, you know, school visit or whatever, let's have a conversation. Let's talk it out. Just something uh, where you meet me halfway, but it would start by actually reading the book. Um, so it's still very new to me and I'm still always surprised. I mean, this last year was the first time I ever went to San Diego con, you know, and it's like to finally go there. I've always wanted to go there and I'm walking the weird, down there. Weird year to go. <laughs> oh, I know. Right. And then I see, uh, this big thing that says banned. And then there is my book on the pedestal that was in the comic book legal defense fund. Pace. It was like, wow, like, holy moly, like the first time I ever come and here's my book that's being that's on a pedestal with a big band sign on it. It's like, holy moly. Uh, it definitely made it memorable. I mean, I, mm. I appreciate the support. I really do. But it was stunning to say the least. Thanks, Jerry. So that uh, Kevin Dooley has a question about uh, what if one parent wants to remove a book? I'm I'm guessing, Kevin, that as a high school teacher, you might have come across this. Yeah, middle school teacher, yes. Uh, I did have some parents who say, I don't want my child to read this book. And how did you deal with it? What happened? I, I dealt with it by, uh, unfortunately, having that child having to read a completely different book. And mm -hmm. they had completely different uh, assignments for that book. It was more difficult for that child because they weren't they didn't feel as if they were a part of the class their parent were was basically taking them out of the the, the socialization the group work from the classroom and i could tell that the the kid was embarrassed for his because of his parent and and did the did that did that kid later get the book and read it himself anyway uh well <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know. <laughs> I, I certainly made it available to him. Thanks, Michael. Michael, uh, Michael, the other Dooley. <laughs> well, I'm sure to your parents, you're both equal, but uh, the other Dooley, um, 
you had a personal question that uh, is fine with me if you want you wanted to talk about comics creators wrong-headed views what what uh what did you, what do you mean oh it, that uh, is regarding something that uh, happened uh, i should mention by the way that that the reason that i created uh, my design history of comics class at uh, at art center was uh, it was a direct uh, result repercussion of the uh, of the Charlie Hebdo murders in January seventh, twenty fifteen, and th that's how it that's how it came about. And it was one of those things that is is part of my teaching, uh, certainly. Uh, and it was and and one of the things that we the discussions that we quickly got into and have been uh, carrying on. I've got uh, I'll be doing that class in. Uh, two weeks this, this semester. One, one of that, uh, one of the situations that arose there, and this is pretty much, you know, yes, we have, we have Paris, we have a, you know, a secular culture, culture, we have a different, all sorts of different mindsets going on there, but what brought it home, I mean, as in literally the United States, was that there were people taking stands, I mean, you know, there, when Pan America, in a couple of months after it happened, wanted wanted to uh, oh, oh, honor the mag magazine and the people who who survived Edo uh, with a courage award. Two hundred members uh, went and, and protested. But even more than that, the the big deal it still sticks in micro. And I'd love to hear uh, pro or con uh, in terms of Gary Trudeau's statement after the uh, after the the murders or. Uh, the, the way he puts, the way he put it in his speech, the tragedy, uh, he wouldn't even say the word murders. And uh, yeah, he just basically, you know, bottom line, he, he was blaming the victims. You know, he was like, oh, here, let me, this is a, I am not going to share a screen, but I am going to copy paste a terrific uh, cartoon that uh, Daryl Cagle did uh, at, at this time, uh, editorial uh, cartoonist, yeah, that you can all like uh, click, click, and and take a look at it, and and basically uh, it was uh, one of those. Oh, and K Kegel had a great uh, uh, he, when he was writing about that that cartoon, he brought in the uh, a quote from Finley Peter Dunn, the great creator of the cartoon character Mister Dooley, and you know basically his credo was, you know, it's like no, but but. Trudeau's saying about punching up and punching down, you know that that's that's bullshit, especially the way he's using it. And so his thing was the press must comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And then, and then Daryl goes on to say Trudeau's cartoons don't comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Trudeau simply chooses targets that he feels comfortable afflicting targets that don't shoot back. <laughs> which I, I thought would, but yeah, that's, you know, that's pretty much what, uh, what was going on there. And it's like, you know, and this, this guy is, I, is hard, there was hardly any pushback with that. Uh, and, and, you know, the sensibilities are, you know, get just, again, you know, I'm not, don't want to blow the panic horn here, but, but you know, shit's getting real <laughs> in term in terms of, uh, the the kind of pushback, and in terms of you know certain pockets of uh, of uh, liberal, I mean, obviously, got to give credit where credit is due. The right does a much better job in so many ways about getting this kind of ban the books, ban the graphic novels message of, 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 uh, <laughs> across. And I remember that, uh, a mutual friend of a couple of people, and uh, no, Jim Thompson. Uh, who we were having a discussion like uh, right right before the, the panel at the uh, at Comic Con and and <laughs> he he put it very well he said the left is too inept to be that effective <laughs> you know so it's again it, it's a matter of uh, being able to you know to fight back make one of my ways of fighting back was was starting you know starting a class that you know that it got uh, that upset anyway I don't know if that's something anybody wants to get into the you know, discuss any further, but I just, I really want, you know, I, I really want people to know, you know, ex exactly 
<laughs> that not everything <laughs> that the left says is 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 brilliant. In fact, in my opinion, what he said was abhorrent. Uh, and that's enough speechifying. Okay. Um, I, I think we're about to you know, getting close to wrapping up. Anybody else on the panel have any any kind of final message or question they want to leave uh, the audience uh, with? No. We, no. Got all, we got all good questions in the in the chat. I don't see any other questions. Real, there's a lot of statements, a lot of statements in the chat, but not a lot of actual questions. Sure. Don't censor those. You want? Oh, please, please, you all talk. No. And, and Jeff, I do want you. To what know. I was what I was going to say is, you know, it's one of one of the things that I that I harp on, on constantly is, you know, Marshall McLuhan talked about our comics, our participatory medium. Um, you know, we don't just want to read them. We want to be part of them and, and part of part of comics. We want to create comics. We want to be active fans. You know, we want to dress like what we see in comics. Um, but, you know, defending comics is participatory as well. And it's my hope, you know, as long as, you know, the, the remaining time I have here at the CBLDF, um, that we'll do everything we can to help uh, create a national networks that are as effective as the networks that are challenging comics. I, I want to see local networks uh, nationally connected uh, that can defend them. Right on. Jeff, can you put the contact info for the uh, Legal Defense Fund in the? Uh... Oh yeah, I, I, you can uh, to uh, you can email me directly right here. And this our website is my uh, name or our general is. Just put, just put it in the chat because I want to get to other people. Yeah, I'm doing it right now. Thank you. Yep. Dennis, were you about to say something? Dennis Kitchen, were you about to? No, I was just said right on to what Jeff said. That's all. Right. And uh, Jeff Smith. Okay, Jerry. I think we oh, said good. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, ben, did you want to add anything or? Uh... Uh, no. I mean, only that in, back in the 18th century, when the censorship was the norm by the church and by monarchies and governments, all of the publicity against the Enlightenment is what made it happen. So this stuff tends to, in some periods, backfire. I mean, people, you know, somebody hears an artist being booed, I mean, you'd want to see what they're doing that gets that kind of reaction. So I hope people, uh, what do you call it, question these things, question any reaction to anything. So, but anyway. Well, thanks. I, I, so I just want to thank all the panelists, uh, Jeff Trexler and Jeff Smith and, and uh, Dennis Kitchen and uh, Jerry Kraft, and who, who did I leave out? Oh, and Michael Dooley, the other Dooley, uh, the main Dooley, he's the main Dooley. No, no offense, Kevin. Anyway, thank you, thank you everybody who showed up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Henry left without uh, getting to yell at me uh, live, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's keep doing it again. Let's find other venues. Oh, that'd be great. Sounds good to me. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, uh, Will Eisner, and thank you, uh, um, Carl and Nancy Gropper and the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, keep fighting the good fight, everybody, and um, and then we'll see you in the funny papers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Take care.